Hello, hello. Hey there, hey there. Welcome in. Welcome in to another Achievers exclusive. I'm Josh Ellis, Editor-in-Chief of Success Magazine. And my guest today, one of the greatest athletes in the world. He's the reigning UFC heavyweight champion, Francis Ngannou, whose story is one that should inspire anybody. Francis rose from poverty in Cameroon to greatness on the mixed martial arts world stage. And now he's passing on that blessing through the Francis Ngannou Foundation, bringing to children in his home nation the skills to expand their horizons and reach their dreams. Francis, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, I was I was telling Laura, who set up the interview beforehand, that I am not uh, I'm not much of a UFC expert, so I had to. I had to ask, uh, you know, for a little background info on you, who told me um, that you are probably the hardest puncher in the world. And I'm going to quote him now. He said, you are an absolute destroyer of worlds. So uh, if people if people say to me after this, that, Josh, you didn't ask the tough questions. I want to get out ahead of it. That's why. I'm trying to stay on Francis's good side. Uh, well, what is the tough question? Well... <laughs> We're gonna, we'll see. I, hopefully, they're not too tough. But um, excited to, to to have the conversation. Um, as I said, you have an amazing story. Um, I want to I want to start. I want to start with, if you don't mind, with some of your earliest years. Um, this is out there. You grew up in a small village in Cameroon. Your parents were divorced when you were young. You lived with some other family members. Um, it was tough. What are, what are some of your earliest memories? Um, one of my earliest memory, uh, it was um, he's been with my family, with my uh, dad, because my dad was my my hero, and uh, for me he was uh, he was the best man ever exist until they got divorced, and then uh, I had to. You know, he was a shock that uh, when I had to like realize um, who he was really from the outside view, you know, how people view him and how they talk about him. And uh, that was my uh, biggest memory about it because uh, to see how everything collapsed at once, uh, the guy that was your hero, um, you find out that you know, he's not well uh, appreciated out there uh, of who he is. And, um, you know, he was tough uh, to digest that at many time as the divorce of my parent. And I was just like six years old and I was uh, just lost my family because I wasn't with my family parents anymore, neither of neither my whether it's my dad or my mom, I was just with cousin uh, in my hands and was just another kid from our house that I was the kid, you know, so it was a very tough uh, moment, but he's the memory that uh, stick with me forever because I remember at that specific moment make myself a promise uh, not to have the same reputation as my dad, even though he was the guy that I love, I love the most, you know, but uh, didn't want to have his reputation. Well, tell us about that reputation. What, uh, what, what did you discover? Well, um, he didn't know how to handle things like, um, you know, without using his punch or, you know, didn't know much to uh, deal with uh, dialogues and stuff. So it was kind of like violent, you know, uh, fighting everywhere, um, everywhere, fighting people. And uh, it wasn't a good reputation to have. And it wasn't really the that that I, I have imagined in the past a uh, few years of age is my yeah so mm, a little disappointed about that but uh, the guy was to my 
he was the, my my hero though. And then after after the divorce, um, I know you lived with cousins, aunt, grandmother at a time. Um, it was sort of a foster situation. Um, can you talk us through the progression of of what life was like between the divorce and you know age ten when you went to work? He was very tough because um, you know in Africa with poverty, unfortunately nobody can really take. Uh, freely take care of his kid. Then he has to, this one kid, extra kid that he's gonna take care of. At some point, somebody, uh, everyone was like, I can't anymore. Well, I did this for six months to help you. I did this for one year to help uh, you, but uh, I have to figure out uh, to look up to my own kids, which uh, I'm struggling about that. So I can't take this extra charge. and. That's how I keep moving from um, from different places until um, we ended up to my uh, where to the village where my grandma my grandma was at at the time uh, just before he got sick she got sick and uh, my mom came there but uh, the the past four years three or four years before I get to the village it was quite challenging. It was a, a huge shock for me. Uh, you know, from my uh, little uh, heaven, piece of heaven, piece, uh, which was my family, to see all that collapse and then have to deal with the entire world and everything that was unknown, everything that wasn't familiar to me and uh, everything that I have ever liked uh, wasn't there anymore. So it became very tough at the point that uh, I had to create a virtual war. Like <laughs> I had a virtual war on my own in my mind to be able to, to escape uh, sometime and then go there and pretend like living a real life. So, and he helps, even though he was just uh, for a few minutes, he was, he wasn't a real life, but he was just a life in my mind with everything looks perfect with my family and everything as I would like, like it to be, you know, uh, I always escape to, to go to that virtual world and uh, I grew up with it. I live with it for a very long time. I think uh, I still have, a little bit of it even today. <laughs> yeah, so that was it. Tell us about that future world, that process of, of picturing it. Was it just a daydream? Did you, I don't know, did you draw pictures of it, write about it? What was your process of, of, of sort of thinking about the future? Uh, you know, at the time, I wasn't thinking too much about the future. You know, I was just a kid. I was like five, uh, like uh, six this was between six to nine years old. So, you know, at that age, you don't think about the future. You just, just as a kid, you think about like, uh, what is your main problem at, at the time, which is like um, your family, uh, people that you care of and you can see, you miss your parents, uh, your siblings, um, you miss everything. And sometimes uh, you're hungry, you're starving, you don't have, clothes and anything you so and uh so the those future world was just about like the basic stuff that uh i missed you know those stuff that i wanted to have such as my family such as with being with my family my mom and my dad you know um my siblings and then uh, we have to get something that was kind of like the thing that I was by that time uh, picturing in my virtual world. Obviously moving on uh, with time, um, yes, you get it some point that uh, embrace dreams, like, you know, it's kind of like grow at the same time, uh, like in your life, you grow in parallel with, with the real life, you know, have a dream, have things that you would like to achieve, that picture how you would like your life to be, which kind of mind you would like to be, uh, which is anything uh, 
besides uh, not like your dad, you know. So it was those type, those type of things. And uh, obviously, by uh, as time goes by, it's kind of like evolve himself that future war. I can imagine, um, you know, some someone who went through what you did as a kid, just being angry, and yet it sounds like you were still a very hopeful kid. Was there anger, and how did you um, stay focused on on the hope for some better times? At first, there was a uh, I would not say anger. At first, there was like uh, disappointment, um, upset which is still different than anger. And then um, I remember exactly um, when I feel the anger and I was, I was 13 years old. And what's what happening, like I've been working in the sun uh, quarry for like a couple of years already to be able to provide, to uh, uh, afford like, um, school uh, supplies such as pen books and scholarship and it wasn't enough so at school i was kind of like viewed by other students by other kids as the one that uh, does have pen or this because they had everything you know so i was the one oh the one always struggling the one that they will always like uh, kick out of the classroom because he didn't he doesn't have like a book or a pen or a notebook um or a backpack whatever is that and at the break i will not have lunch to eat so it wasn't a good uh, profile to be a friend to other kids so no many kids were so excited to be a f- friend with that cap- type of guy and uh regardless uh my effort that i was doing to have something on my own to uh follow up with um with the world you know so um I was 13 years old and I was in the in middle school. I remember one day I have I had to leave the class uh, earlier. I think it was at three, two or three p.m. Uh, I was starving and then uh, once again uh, the teacher kicked me out from the classroom because I didn't. Uh, that time was because of the scholar uh, scholar fee. That day, something happened. Like I, I, I recap my life, think about everything that I'm doing, you know, uh, trying to figure out uh, what did I do wrong um, and couldn't see anything. And uh, like, just realized that um, those kids, even though they look uh, me down, they don't have uh, anything more than me. They don't deserve anything more than me. They just have luck. They just have, uh, they just been lucky to have a parent who can uh, provide for them, uh, which is not my case, but uh, obviously uh, the minimum that I have, uh, I earned it. I know the value of it. And uh, that was my anger, like seeing how um, to have what I had, uh, I have to struggle to work hard and then uh, to sacrifice so much because I never go to vacation or whatever is that because even the weekend was the opportunity to me to go uh, to go out there hustle uh, work and uh, get something you know um, so I kind of like think about all those stuff then I realized that uh, no I wasn't beneath them they wasn't worth worth it than me i didn't just have a chance and uh the way that uh i was used for kids to look at me it wasn't great you know so i decided that i'm gonna prove them all wrong uh i'm gonna prove them all wrong by my action i'm gonna prove them all wrong by um achieving something which is which at that point I need something, uh, no, some ordinary thing uh, to make it happen because uh, they will not even notice, but I need something extraordinary. So uh, he came to me that I have to do something big, 
to step in the first stage so they all can see me and realize that um, I wasn't worthless, you know. So there on, like my anger was speaking and uh, I was always like about it, like upset about my situation, uh, angry about my, my situation, you know. So everything that I do from there on, it was to make a point to prove that I'm not uh, worthless, you know. I didn't just have a chance as a kid, but uh, I didn't deserve less than them, you know. So it was just a um, matter of luck, but uh, not my fault. And uh, that's where I combine that. I combine that anger with my dream of doing anything related to a combat sport, to a power. Um, without being violent and uh, carry a bad reputation as my dad. So I combined those two and he came to, he came to me that uh, the best thing to go do is a boxing. We will put me on the big stage and then show those kids that I'm not worthless and uh, keep me to, pre to uh, do what I love, which is, martial combat, uh, combat in general without having the reputation that my dad uh, had, you know. So that was when I, find, I found out that boxing would be the perfect thing for me. But problem, there wasn't a boxing, I never see a boxing gym around and there wasn't a boxing gym like maybe f uh, 50 miles around. You couldn't find any of them and uh, didn't have time for them because the minimum time that I had was to go work. So I have to deal with this controversy situation, uh, but carry the dream until I was, I left school at 17 and still expecting to go back because I left school because I couldn't afford the next year. Um, then, uh, was still expecting to go back at some point, but couldn't make it. So by 22, I decided to let everything and go chase my dream. I found the move to a different city uh, that I didn't know, uh, a new city, and just find a boxing gym and went there to like chase my dream. So my first boxing class, it wasn't just like a, to a regular boxing. Like from my first day there, uh, the goal was all to be a world champion, to make a point. Obviously, uh, it wasn't like uh, easy because that was a lot of pressure on me, uh, basically from the country that nobody has ever done it in the big stage. And uh, nobody even believed that I am going to make it. They thought I was losing it, but uh, stubborn as I was, so... It's amazing that you can talk through basically, uh, if I do the math, about 10 years of, of your life there. And, and there was so much that went on. I, I, you, you mentioned you, you worked in a sand mine that started when you were 10 years old. I, I watched uh, your interview with Joe Rogan and he was asking you, um, you know, if it has you know, occurred to you that without that, you know, very physical labor, maybe you don't grow up to be as strong as you are. Does it occur to you now that without that anger that you had as a teenager, um, that, you know, you probably don't have the motivation that, that you have now? Like, it's all part of what you would become that would give you this amazing talent and skill and work ethic to get to where you are. Like you don't, if you had some other background, like you end up with a completely different life. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, um, obviously, um, this working in the sign mine helped me develop my physique. Uh, but I was very strong since my very young age. And in my family, we have a reputation of being strong, uh, strong people. But uh, as far as my anger, I I now believe that without that um, uh, childhood, the life that I had, I wouldn't be here. Like I would have, 
I love family life so so bad. So uh, my first dream was just to be a guy with a regular job and just have my own family. You know, uh, it wasn't all about this at first until like uh, this anger came out and uh, this whole situa- situation and uh, get me upset. Then and that was my drive. You know, uh, that was my drive because from there. I was fighting for something to make a point to prove it uh, because I felt I felt um, worthless. I felt um, uh, disrespected. I was out there to gain to earn that respect. I was out there to uh, to earn my path. You know, uh, to take over my own life. You know, so. I honestly believe that without and uh, everything that happened in my life, even though it wasn't uh, my best one, it wasn't the thing that I would have choose. Uh, all those uh, was the thing that uh, led me where I am today. Without that, I wouldn't be here. Definitely not, because like knowing how uh, I was and uh, every stage of my life, like you know everything uh came together to um bring me uh where i am you know you you talked through um the process of getting to age 22 where you could start working in a boxing gym um there's a lot to that story too you went from cameroon and and were basically smuggled right this is human smuggling to, to get yourself to europe i mean you're essentially risking your life you're you guys are robbed uh, along the way and you spend some time um in spain in a in you know sort of an immigration jail type situation uh, that was uh you know, a, a, you're risking your life to make that move. What was sort of the point that you came to the decision to say, like, this is worth it to go for? It? I don't know exactly how to explain that, but you have some you have some feeling sometimes that you can't explain. The anger that we were talking about, like you're upset about your own life. You you have to do something. You have to take action. You have to dare in order to expect a change. You have to do something for your own destiny. Like, at that point, no many, no many didn't matter, you know? Like, uh, we've been through stuff out there, putting ourselves in danger, like reckless. Man, I can't even imagine, like today, when I think about some of those stuff uh, that we've been through in order to make it in Europe, honestly, if you put me back there, I'm turning around and around. I'm not doing it anymore. Like, this is crazy. You know, I can't even believe that I have done some of those stuff. But uh, I was drive by my anger, by my motivation, my dream to become somebody. For me, you know, he was just like, you know, those moments in your life that you felt like enough is enough. You know, doesn't matter what it takes. Obviously, you don't say it loud, like, doesn't matter how, uh, if it takes my life, but you feel that way. You feel like even your life doesn't matter to you uh, anymore. Like, what matters the most is the dream. The dream is above everything in your life, and you just see your dream. You don't think, see the um, danger around. You don't see the obstacles. You just put yourself into everything possible to uh, to get to your dream, to pursue your dream. And then when you get there, you look back and you're like, "Man, this was nonsense!" Like. Nobody with a uh, normal life, nobody was thinking straight, uh, could have done such a thing, you know? But uh, we all know like when you're upset, your anger, uh, your emotion control, control, control you. And that's basically what's happened at that time. 
And the worst part is like, at that time, even though he was tough, I couldn't allow myself to feel uh, the pain, uh, the roughness of the situation. The only thing that uh, I was trying to wash everything in my uh, in my mind and make it all about the dream, the uh, the finish line. It was all about the finish line. Doesn't matter what you're into. You just think about the finish line, finish line. And that was the motivation until someday you get to the finish line, you know, but yeah, that was it. It, it, It's just, it's so hard for people from, I guess, the West to, to comprehend just that journey. And then you make it to Paris, which at some point along the way probably felt like the finish line, but then you get there and you're homeless for a few months. What, what, is, what were those first, you know, few few months that first time um, in Paris like until you got introduced to Fernand Lopez? When I get in Paris and I was homeless and um, but I think that was the one of the biggest moment in my life that I was very happy because what I always asked for um, was the. Uh, opportunity and I felt like I am somewhere with opportunity for me uh, that wasn't a finish line of my dream that but that was uh, a big step forward you know because I didn't expect that I'm gonna get somewhere someday and everything just gonna be perfect you know I knew that it's gonna be challenging I knew that I'm gonna go after it I'm gonna earn uh, everything uh, that I want uh, by hard work, but at least I want the opportunity. And in Paris, I felt that um, I felt that I have an opportunity. You know, it was a, a place of opportunity. Obviously, people was around telling me all the stuff that uh, uh, how hard is Paris or you're uh, expecting too much and this and that, you know, Paris uh, is not uh, a um, heaven, you know, but uh, what they didn't know is like, I wasn't expect to get somewhere that would just be perfect. I want just wanted somewhere that I can build my own piece of heaven, you know, uh, meaning like work for it. And, um, so I was so uh, full of enthusiasm, um, um, optimism, you know, because I was there with what I always wanted in my life, with what I never had, which is like hope, dream, feel like it's possible. Just the fact to feel that it's possible if you put yourself in work, I think that was the uh, a biggest release for my own person, you know. And uh, obviously, um, I worked with, uh, I went to the gym, um, and then just meet people and, you know, just explain them the situation uh, that I'm homeless. I just make it there, but the only thing that I want is to become the world champion. And uh, that was a boxing, that was a gym boxing class. And um, yeah, and then I met uh, a guy named Didier Carmon who uh, walked me through to everything, allowed me to ask, helped me to access that gym, even though he wasn't the coach. And uh, until uh, later on, um, because he was convinced that MMA would be the, uh, would be my faster income regarding my situation. So when uh, the, that gym closed for the vacation for August, uh, I went to the uh, to Fernand gym and uh, Didier did everything to keep me uh, there because I didn't want to stay in Fernand gym. But since I was doing MMA there and Didier, he does everything. He did everything in order for me to stay there. Um, he, he took a sub. Um, uh, subscription there and everything sometimes come with me 
just because he wanted me so bad to do MMA. And that's how I keep doing. And, uh, you know, yeah, that was a good trip. And he was always around for me. And um, he also uh, gave me a house uh, for a few months. He helped me a lot in that situation. So when, when was your first professional fight then? Oh, first one I get paid for? It was in Paris. Do you remember in, how uh, much? Do you remember how much you made? Yeah, he was a MMA. He was already in MMA, so like um, he was a tournament, and uh, I made a uh, two thousand euro. I went in the tournament. Now uh, that was two thousand fourteen. You, uh, of course, you make considerably more than that now, <laughs> um, but for somebody then, having been what you've been through, two thousand euros is a lot. Um, yeah, of course, when, it was a lot. When along the way, whether it was that, whether it was before that, whether it was after that, when did you say like, I've done it? I'm, I'm. Maybe, maybe it wasn't until March when you became the heavyweight champion. But when did you dis, you know, realize that I, I, everything that I wanted, I've done it. I have achieved success. You know, uh, growing up, uh, my dream was always to be uh, in America in the US. That was my biggest dream. And uh, I love the US so much. And <laughs> I used to have nicknames like American Boy. That was my nickname growing up. Like I named myself like American Boy. And uh, even my signature, my official signature right even now, I used to sign like San Francisco, like SF. And people like, there's no S on your name. I'm like, that's a long story. So the reason why I even stay in France was because, you know, obviously I was, um, I wanted to go to the UK or to Germany where boxing was more, uh, was bigger. But um, then I realized that to go in the UK is going to be a, an, another uh, big problem. And I found out, I found out that um, at the end of the day, I still want to go to the US, you know. So uh, I better like just stay in Paris and take the opportunity, uh, do whatever I can do. Then I will um, make it in the in my fi final destination from there instead of like uh, taking more step, which is might not even be necessary. And then uh, in 2015, I got my uh, UFC contract, my first UFC contract. And um, I came here for the fight. Who was uh, in uh, Orlando, in Florida, in December 2015. And uh, I landed in Orlando. And uh, we have a, a, a driver SUV waiting for, for us at the airport taking my suitcase and everything. It was a Cadillac Escalade too, and a big ass Cadillac. So took me to the hotel, I check in, and uh, uh, I Hyatt Hotel, a big ass hotel too. And uh, at that moment, I think, <laughs> I, I, that was the moment that I feel like I made, I made it. Like, Listen, man, uh, I'm in the US that I always dreamed. Uh, and not like, I didn't make it in the US like I made it in France, you know, by the service door. I made it here by the main door. Which, which, kind of, which way uh, can you expect to get somewhere as I did it in the US? You know, like I get to the uh, um, airport, the driver was waiting for me and the big hotel was, I was uh, booked in the big hotel and everything. They was treating me like the man, you know, like take my bag, put it, open doors for me. Uh, I went there, check in for my room. And I think at that moment I called my, my mom uh, and I'm like, hey, uh, like what's up mom? Like just a little, you know, fancy. And she was like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, well, your son has made it, you know? Like, 
<laughs> like, yeah, I'm in the U.S. and everything, you know. It wasn't like when I went in France, I was afraid and then didn't want to deal with cops. Like, I'm like, oh, these guys, they might like just, uh, I might just have like some uh, uh, immigration issue here, you know. And uh, it wasn't the same situation anymore. I was free and I was the man for the show. I came here for the show. And yeah, that was the moment that I'm like, yeah, I made it. You know, you've, you've obviously, your career has grown since then. You've won a lot of fights. You've, you've, you've uh, gotten better as a, as a fighter. Um, how did you, how did you keep going? How, how did you like, you know, not experience that success and rest on your laurel. What what drove you to to keep putting in the work, uh, physically, technically, um, as a fighter to to uh, just keep pushing ahead? Obviously, uh, my career has uh, evolved. Uh, things are getting better for me, but uh, I don't consider. Um, myself as a success as a success man you know a successful man uh i still believe that uh i there is a lot of room to me to go there is i still have uh miles a lot of miles to go you know and uh, anyway this is just about the principle this is just about um I mean, don't get me wrong. I love my job. I love fighting and I love everything that goes with it. But that's not exactly where my dream is at. My dream is not just being a uh, fighter or whatever. My dream is being a, uh, just to be a man who fight against odds, you know, who uh, make things that seems impossible to be uh, possible, you know. Um, to escape your limit, and every day we find we found uh, we find our limit, and there's always a way to escape that limit and keep going. You know, um, today even than uh, before, my dream is even bigger than it was uh, five years ago. You know, I have more pressure. I feel like I have more to do than I had uh, to do five years ago. There is always a uh, you know, there is not like a real finish line. It's just one step after another. You 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 have a finish line. Uh, then when you get close, you push it again for another mile. Again, one mile after another, and then uh, the goal is to uh, do the maximum miles as much as possible. You know maybe once at the time, uh, focus on everyone as he was, like he was the last, but uh, never stop, you know. Like, yes, everything that I have done is good, but uh, it doesn't matter uh, that much anymore because I have done it already. Yes, when uh, he was on Achieve, he was a big deal, but now, that's it, you know. So I find another uh, finish line would drive me and motivate me. Uh, and that's how I keep going. And obviously, I have a long way to go. Tell us about that night in March when you beat Stipe Miocic. Oh, that was a great night, though. That one was a great night. Uh, not only because I, uh, I won the fight, but because I became a world uh, heavyweight world champion uh, which is a big deal which is great amazing but uh, mostly because like at that specific moment I felt like I defeated uh, my life I defeated the uh, challenge the challenge that I had in my life I defeated all the obstacles that I had in my life that was a point of like you know the big stage that I always wanted to step on and then to let all those uh, kids see me like well that guy is not bad to have you uh, 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 by the way it's even better you know um, I did by doing what I love 
uh, what I'm passionate about it, which is like combat, combat sport. And, uh, you know, I make it clear and loud that uh, I'm not worthless. And, uh, you know, at that specific moment, I felt like I, I gave a little slap to my past, to all the obstacles in my uh, life, like, hey, shut up, sh shut up, like, I beat you up, you know, like, I take, I took those proud at that specific moment. And uh, I think that was the, the biggest feeling about it, you know, because it's standing there and thinking about, like, maybe just 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, man, he was like a very controversial situation. He felt like it was two different life because from where I was, it wasn't even, a, I wasn't even expected to be in this stage. Uh, and not, to, not just to be in this stage, but to take over, literally, you know. So that was the biggest part about it. And then uh, to see my, to think about like, oh, my family, all what we've been through, everything. We became the, we became not that family, but we became the family, you know, like we, it's us, like uh, they don't look us down anymore. We, we get respect, a good respect, you know. Um, <laughs> my mom by herself, she's famous. She do, she did like commercial, she's on beer balls. And now I'm like, this is it, you know? Yeah, so that's kind of like my pride, my pride. I'm not a, as I said at the beginning, I'm not a UFC expert uh, or mixed martial arts expert, but what I understand about the heavyweight division is uh, everybody is, is uh, huge and have muscles popping out of, of everywhere and they all have, you know, toasters for hands like yourself. And in this division, people don't tend to stay on top for very long because everybody everybody hits so hard that you're maybe just one punch away from from um, losing your crown, right? Um, yeah. So talk talk through sort of the what that means um, for your mindset as you go forward as a fighter and maybe just relishing being on top of the of the mountain while you are. Listen, the good thing is like I've, I've been in the bottom and um, I know how, what it takes to get where I am now. And uh, obviously I will do everything to stay where I am. But um, there is one thing that I have learned during the process is that I'm capable of a lot, you know. Um, and this doesn't apply only on fighting, on everything. Uh, it happens more than once that I, I think that, okay, what about if I lost everything and I have to start, you know? And uh, that's where I realized that I'm a successful man, that I have made it, not because of what I have, but because of where I am, mindset on in my mindset you know uh when you get at the point that you're not afraid uh, of losing that's when you become a winner because you you know that doesn't matter what happened you can handle the situation doesn't matter what is the obstacle you can face it and you can overcome it i think that's the the moment that uh you became a uh accomplishment, you know, a grown man. Um, we can stay there here all day long, start to uh, get concerned about what will happen in the future. Uh, obviously, we always do our best. We don't have a con we don't have control of what will happen. But um, what I do know for sure is that whatever come my way, I will overcome it and I will even do better. Like three, just three years ago, um, I was in my down, uh, my like, like my lowest uh, situation, professional-wise, uh, when I lost against TP, and then after that uh, against uh, Derek Lewis because I 
I was afraid of losing that I didn't even fight. And then uh, that was the lowest that I have, you could imagine for an athlete. But I didn't give up, you know. I made it all the way from down there to make it all the way uh, up here. So meaning I have the skills of overcoming obstacles, of overcoming uh, fighting challenges, and uh, I will keep doing that. That's my my own, my uh, trophy. That's my title that nobody can t- never take that from me. You know, I, I own that. That's my own, my ability to overcome uh, everything coming my way. You know, if he, uh, if I had to go back to, to be homeless, yes, that sucks, but I'm going to make it back. You know, I'm going to overcome that. So I'm not afraid of that. So I don't think about, uh, I don't think that way. I'm like, doesn't matter what happened. I will always make sure that I do my best. And my best, uh, he appears that my best is good enough to overcome everything. Does it really register with you how... Um, amazing this story is. <laughs> I mean, you've lived it, but do, do you know? Do you recognize the the inspiration and the motivation that that other people derive from from what you've been through and what you represent? Uh, not really, because for me, it's just my life. You know, uh, for me, he's not a story, as you're saying. For you, it might be a story, but for me, it's my life. So at some point, uh, for me, he's just like normal. You know, uh, if I don't talk with other people and found out that we have different story, uh, different life, then I will not know because for me, it's the only thing that I know and it make it seems normal to me. <laughs> You're a hero in Cameroon um, because of because of that story, but but you're also giving back to the kids there through the Francis Ngannou Foundation. Um, tell us tell us about why you started that. Well, um, <laughs> so at first it wasn't even about the foundation. Um, you know, uh, as I said earlier, I was in, I was very young when I had a dream, like to become a, uh, a, a boxer. And I always loved combat sport, even since when I was a kid, as far as I can remember. But there wasn't a gym around. There was nothing. So like, <laughs> I was going in the uh, farm and kick like uh, banana trees and destroy them. And then after get beat up with, by my parents because that was, was supposed to like grow a banana and so we can eat. So I didn't have anything to like practice on it, but I was so in love with that, those stuff, like trying to uh, use everything that uh, I, have a hold on to like do something, you know. So I always miss those uh, stuff such as back boxing bags or uh, gloves, gym, everything with that come comes with. And um, when I went in France, I saw that there was a lot of waste. Not maybe not a waste for where from where they 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 are at but a waste from where I'm from, you know, those things that they throw in the trash that they don't use it anymore uh, because they, they feel like it's all for us. I think that how uh, how that would be like a brand new stuff, uh, that would have been something great if I had it when I was there just thinking about it. It was like, man, this is something that I have to take it back in Cameroon. Even though at that time I didn't need it anymore, um, and I was having even a free stuff, you know, having like sponsors, having friends who will hang you some pair of gloves and uh, uh, even some bags, and then I started to collect those stuff. I'm like, I'm not uh, throwing this. Like, I'm gonna make a best use out of those stuff. And then I started to collect them and ship it in uh, Cameroon. And I just wanted to open like a gym in the in my village. And, you know, because that was a place that uh, I always expected somebody to come there and uh, build a gym or something. I would, you know, as a kid, I thought that would have been great, amazing. 
So unfortunately, that person never show up. And uh, yeah, I was in France having those opportunities, collected those stuff, ship it out. So I I wanted to build a gym since that was already in my mind. And now I'm like, if there is some kids out there, one or two kids out there who has a dream that I had uh, at that time, uh, just imagine what that would have meant for me at that time. I'm like, then this what you make this worth it, way more worth it. So I'm gonna do it anyway. And um, uh, as time goes by, I realize that just building a gym would not be enough. Those kids, they just need so much. They need everything. So uh, that's what I decided to like make it as a foundation instead of like just a gym because he's a community place. Uh, I made it a foundation because I could have uh, I could have collect clothes, shoes that people don't wear anymore that they think is old, is old or whatever, and ship it there. And for those who they don't who don't have any uh, who are walking barefoot, they don't have clothes. Uh, for them, it's just a brand new stuff, you know. Uh, I can collect those pants, uh, uh, pencils, and then ship it back there. For those kids who don't, who, uh, don't have it as uh, I didn't have, it will be such a big deal for them. So that's why I did it uh, as a foundation instead of like just a gym. It was a, um, it was a, uh, I wanted to create a community uh, place for kids, you know, a community place, meaning like a place that we can help them with anything that we can, not just like provide them a place to train, but sometimes like we provide clothes, we provide shoes, everything uh, that we we have a goal on. Um, and now things are doing uh, very good. I have sponsors now that partner with me uh, to have my foundation, such as uh, Gymshark, um, Noco, all my sponsor now. I don't make a deal with sponsor if you, you don't commit uh, to do something to my to my foundation, to my kid, to those kids, because, uh, you know, the idea is just to make them feel uh, worth it, you know, to feel like somebody cares about them and from there on uh, they can pick up their pick up their own dream and uh, believe in their dreams and uh, as soon as they have been they believe in their dream you know the rest is just a matter of time success is a matter of time for somebody who believe in it the biggest problem basically in the third world third world um, uh, country is a uh, to keep the dream, you know, because they feel so far to the uh, achievement that the, the easier way to do it is just to give up and forget about it. So um, what I do is like, I just try to do anything that will make them feel that they are worth it. Like, uh, like somebody cares about them, you know, and uh, also to, to allow them to believe that it's possible. It doesn't matter where you start from. Uh, by the way, I started there and uh, I'm not a fairy tale. I'm not a movie. Uh, my story is not a movie that they are watching in the theater. Uh, I'm a real one, you know, I grew up there. Some of those kids, uh, they didn't see me grow up, but their, their parents saw me uh, from the very young age and they know everything. So like, uh, is the proof that it's possible. You know, you can make it on your own. That's the only, that's what we really want uh, with the foundation to empower them to believe in their self because um, paying my experience, I think and believe that uh, somebody who uh, have a dream and believe in it, you know, there is nothing that you can do to this person because he's already a uh, success, succeed. It's just a matter of time, you know. So that's what, that's how I came with the foundation. And uh, we're trying to do whatever we do, uh, provide a gym, train them, sometimes uh, ship clothes, 
close to them, collect stuff. I collect all stuff here, everything, uh, soap, uh, appliances, uh, shoes, clothes, gym equipment, everything that I uh, grab, tents, backpack, I still collect them and then uh, ship it in the container in, uh, in Cameroon and then just give it to them. And uh, those stuff that you uh, hear, you find it is all, believe me, when you get there, it seems like brand new and more appreciated than even how you guys appreciate brand new stuff here because they don't have anything. And uh, yeah, we're just trying to build a community and provide and help them up as much as we can, you know, like, uh, health wise and that's why I'm thinking uh, I want to build a, build a clinic uh, there because they they don't have they have nothing so and uh, today I'm in the position that uh, I have more opportunity and I can also stand up for them uh, it doesn't take me that much to give them a lot uh, so that's what I'm doing. It's amazing work that you do. Last question Thank for me. I, I, combat sports are known for personalities that, you know, they, they talk a lot of smack. There's a lot of hype trying to build up these fights. Uh, everyone puts on this tough guy demeanor. Um, and it's purposeful. You started out this conversation talking about um, your dad's reputation and but you have a reputation of being one of the true gentlemen of ufc um what, what do you hope that you know the, the legacy that you leave behind in your career and, and beyond that in in all of the decades that come in your life after you're done fighting on as much as i love fighting fighting is just a part of my life fighting is not my life and uh I don't want fighting to change who I am, to change my personality because I want to be fan, uh, fancy or because I want to fit in some sort of like, I don't know what is that, you know. Um, I enjoy the process by uh, doing things on my way. It might work or not. I'm cool with it, you know, as far as I do my best. Um, the the way of fitting in something which can, which can make you lose even the most uh, the most thing that you have which is your serve is not how I, I I view myself you know um, the legacy that I want to leave behind me is not about fighting it's about my personality it's about who I am. And uh, obviously, I get at the point that uh, even though it's not what I was expecting, expected, it's not what I signed for, uh, those kids, such as the one in my foundation, or uh, many kids, uh, they see you as a, a model. They want to just want to be like you. Oh, this guy, this, he's massive, he's strong. I want to be like you. I mean, uh, at first, I was like, Oh, that's not my problem. I don't care. No, I didn't sign up for that. Then you realize that uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be what this kid going to end up like is going to be your responsibility. He might just copy some uh, behavior from you, which is bad, and then think he's so cool because he wants to be just like you, and then he will end up bad and that would be on you. Meanwhile, uh, if you show this kid a good thing and he pick up the good thing, you know, obviously we don't have much credit on the good thing that we do than when we do the bad thing. Because believe me, when you do something bad, oh man, all the, all the blame came to you. But still, like, what would it, how many uh, people in their life have the opportunity to do, to impact somebody, some kid's life, even uh, from the distance, you know? I think it's, a, uh, it's an opportunity, it's a blessing that uh, you have that. And uh, 
that could be a legacy that I want to carry on and I want to follow up with this. Uh, basically, um, even after my career, I want to commit more with uh, a work with uh, with a kid around the world. Um, yeah, so that's for me matter than uh, just a compass board and uh, uh, just to fit in. Some people personality and uh, they are good with, you know, uh, I just don't want what I am doing uh, define who I am. I am who doing it, so I the one that uh, supposed to be in control and uh, uh, make it go my own way, you know. Francis, I'm I am grateful just to have had the opportunity to help share, you know, your story and your perspectives and uh, with our audience. Um, so thank you for all the work that you do and um, congratulations on you know living a life and and and, and you know, overcoming the obstacles that you have uh, in a way that you can be proud of and and uh, that everybody else can can draw some inspiration. Thank, thank you for sharing it with us today. Thank you, Josh. I also, um, by myself, appreciate the opportunity um, to for the platform and to you to help me uh, share the story or uh, the experience. It was a good talk. It really was. Thank you to all of you who uh, joined us today. I know that. Uh, this will not be one that anyone soon forgets. Soon forgets. Francis has some training to get to uh, so that he can go <laughs> kick some more butt uh, in 2022. Thank you all, Francis. I appreciate the time. Everybody, we'll see you next time on Achievers Exclusives. So long. Thank you, Josh. Pleasure.